Welcome to our discussion group for Everyday Sajness, in our introduction to Buddhism course. Um, initially, I would like to start by apologizing for some of the scheduling conflicts that we've had um, between little kids and my job and life in general and being absent-minded poet. Uh, <laughs> the scheduling hasn't always been the greatest, so um, I do apologize for that. Um, we're here now. We're here now, and that's what matters. Uh, so today we're going to be going over the Everyday Suchness book. Um, but before we begin, let's go ahead and start um, just with a bell. Um, and what I'm thinking is we'll do, in Bright Dawn, was called um, Three Treasures Breathing. So we'll hit the bell, we'll take in a breath, and when you breathe out, you say Buddha, and then we'll do another one, you breathe in and breathe out, you say Dharma, and the last one is Sangha. So it's the three treasures of Buddhism, okay? Okay, so um, I'm really excited about talking about this book. Can you guys can come in a little closer? You know, we can, we can be, <laughs> hold your hand. You're so. more than welcome. Okay. I'm very comfortable in my sexuality. Um, it's like, you know, when you hug a guy, you know, it's like, don't, you don't have to pat my back. I know you're not gay. It's okay. Neither am I. <laughs> um, so Everyday Sessionist is really an important book to the Salt Lake Buddhist Fellowship because in some ways it's like our Sangha modern day sutra or teachings of the Buddha from, from what I like to call our, in some ways our root teacher, which is Guillaume uh, Kabose, who's the founder of um, the Chicago Buddhist Temple and also um, the it developed the way we teach the bright dawn way of, of, of the teachings, applying the teachings, which, as you know, after reading the book, is incredibly pragmatic. Um, it's really straightforward. It's down to earth. Um, and and what, I, what I find interesting with, with the book, the more I read it, is that first it comes across really simple and being kind of a nerdy intellectual ass that I can be. I'm like going, this is too simple. Um, but then when you really start looking at it, it's like looking at a poem. Uh, the more you read it, the more depth you see it, and you see it, you're able to see all these different facets within it. As Sharon knows, because it's the third time she's read it. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's really interesting about the book. Um, so let's just like dive in. So um, Certainly it, when you reread it, you do get more out of it. Yes, yes, yes. Like the first time when we were... Meaning for a little yeah. other thing. I don't think I got nearly as much out of it. Just I was just kind of reading it for the stories. Yeah. And so I have done. something to get it. Yeah, I had to get it done. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I'd have something to talk about. That was bad. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Good. 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 Um, so just overall, first initial impressions when you read the book. What were they? And and again too, this is come as you are. So if you ever don't like a book, you're more than welcome that it bored the hell out of me. Or I loved it and I thought it was profound. Um, this I is an open the discussion. Simple stories and okay. short stories that you can digest like one at a time mm -hmm. and really get into it instead of trying to just tackle a big textbook or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of the other books that we've read are, are a lot harder to to get into. So this, you can just pick up and read one story if you just have a moment yeah. and yeah. 
Yeah, that's a really good observation. A lot of times I do the Audible books, and the thing I enjoyed this time was it's not on Audible. <laughs> I had to buy a copy, and I did the, the thing that, yeah. that is better, which is making these notes. Yeah. So I liked it for that reason. Plus, it was just pocket size. And mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can, like always keep it with you yeah. and just pull it out and yeah. kind of flip through it. Um, and I think there's something about in- engaging with a, a, a tangible book. I love Audible, yeah. and I also like Kindle. Yeah. But there's something about having a tangible it book. And, yeah. And so for me, it's the note taking. Yeah. I started on happiness, and I thought, oh, that's, that's cute. That's nice. I mean, there's lots of ways to that. And then <laughs> by the time I got to non dichotomization, I was like, holy shit, this guy is getting eaten. <laughs> and I'm rereading paragraphs, and so. It's not trite or, or yes. It's, it gets well, yeah, and, and I think it's also interesting to to think from a, the context <clears throat> of of a Jodo Shin background, um, which he comes out of um, the Chicago Temple, um, in in Chicago was was kind of trans sectarian, non sectarian, independent, mm-hmm. but it, it 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 came out of a Jodo Shin tradition. Okay, so the Jodo Shin tradition is really everyday, regular people kind of Buddhism. It was really Buddhism for the common man, for a lot of Buddhists who were not allowed to really participate in the practice because the work they did. You know, they were, um, they were gamblers, they were butchers, they were fishermen. And since they were killing, and the first precept is not killing, they weren't able to participate in a lot of the Buddhist thing, Buddhist practice. So this opened up a way for the average person, the person who couldn't participate, to participate. Um, in some ways, for for the for the for the crook and the prostitute and the the working guy, the working woman, uh, it was a everyday Joe kind of Buddhism. So out of that, kind of culturally too, the way the teachings are expressed are really expressed in a more everyday, matter of fact sort of way. And not so much the 12 steps of dependent origination, the five precepts, you know, the Buddhism by the numbers. It's more, how can I apply this in my everyday life? How can I use this today as I'm driving to work or dealing with that person at work that's really driving me crazy? How can I look at this situation differently? And I think that everyday storytelling and applying it to everyday life helps to, to really bring the Buddha Dharma into our everyday life instead of having it be separate from our everyday life. Right? Um, was there anything that really stuck out to you? Was there one story they go, whoa, that's that's like something, or some of you go, eh, I don't know about that. Well, one thing that was interesting reading through this, you know, you're just how it's almost like a universal application regarding time, and then I'll hit an anachronism in the book like the word Negro, and I'm like, whoa, okay, I remember when this was written. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. And that's really important, too. And, and I mean, there are a few things, too, that are contextual for culture and time. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is always good to, to be aware of that, and it's really interesting how all of a sudden, whoa, <laughs> yeah, good point. I forgot my book, so I'm like trying to remember. <laughs> you can flip I just through ordered mine. it on Amazon. <laughs> sitting here, okay. it's on its way. Okay, good, good. <laughs> what keeps you coming back to this book? I use it all. The, I mean, there's a there's a few things in there that were. It's so simple but so profound. Um, the chapter on limitation mm-hmm. is one I come to all the time. That was um, what I was going to say was the big one for me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the one that I, I think is such a powerful lesson is acceptance is transcendence. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and matter of fact, we're going to talk about that Sunday during our Dharma discussion is what is this acceptance he's talking about? And why is that so hard for us as Westerners in our culture, the way we're taught, um, that we accept the definition of acceptance as surrender or acceptance as defeat, you know? 
um, instead of a path to freedom. Yeah, you kind of feel like it means to settle for something. Yeah, and that's such a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. Why is that such a bad thing? <laughs> well, and so, I mean, that's a good question. Why is the idea of settling such a bad thing within our culture? Because everybody wants to get what they want. But you're not in control of the You're not in control, yeah. We're raised to keep performing and go for bigger and bigger. Okay, yeah, we're raised to keep on going. Yeah. Well, a consumerist society doesn't work really well if you're okay with what you got. That's right. Mm-hmm. It makes it sound like you're giving something up, too. Well, yeah, you're giving something mm-hmm. up for something even better. So it's this, it's this idea that there's always something more, mm-hmm. something better out there. And that's problematic, isn't it? Yeah. It's kind of the concept of looking for that perfectionism somewhere instead of just saying, Ooh, this is okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <coughs> so what was it about the limitation chapter that really resonated with you? Especially with what you're going through <laughs> exactly. right now. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's something that I always work on. I think, oh, I think I'm doing pretty good on that. And then it's something else beyond that happens and you go, maybe I wasn't doing as well as I thought I was. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but that's just the ups and downs of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, he says that acceptance is dynamic. What does he mean, acceptance being dynamic? I mean, I think our general perception of acceptance is it being very passive. Mm-hmm. So what do you think he means by dynamic acceptance? For me, acceptance is more than just like feeling like you're giving up or giving in. You're just saying, this is the reality of what's happening right now. Because it, it takes, it does take some effort to bring yourself present and be there when it's not so pleasant and not so as you wish it would be. It just is. And, and, I, and I think it is an effort to be here. Uh, uh, effort to be in the moment. Yes. Good. Good. And if you're work- and if you're around people that are not accepting things that are still attaching to this and that, and they've got expectations on you and on themselves, it's easy to get lost. You're you're okay one minute. You're you know not attached. You've got um, less expectations. You're going with what is. You're accepting things, and then by the words that are spoken and the interactions that are done to you, it almost forces a reaction from you and you have to dynamically stop yourself and say, wait, mm-hmm. this is not what I think. This is just a script or this is just a reaction. Or this is, you know, or I have to take it on the chin a little bit. Here. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I think uh, most of us have been in um, a relationship or two in our lives that weren't the healthiest. <laughs> either romantic or not romantic. Um, and I think, especially those that tend to be romantic, we, we, it's hard for us to accept when they're not good for us. Okay. Or it's over. Or it's or you over. Can't, or you can't fix it. Mm-hmm. Or just two different personalities or people mm-hmm. that just yeah. aren't meant to get along. So acceptance, acceptance doesn't mean that, well, my my spouse is verbally abusive or physically abusive or my spouse uh, is stepping out on me um, and I just got to accept that. That's not, that's not what that kind of dynamic acceptance is. It's accepting the fact that this is reality. Now what am I going to do about it? Okay? It's that kind of acceptance. It's accepting reality as it is. And if you think about the, the first noble truth and the second noble truth or ennobling truth, the first is that life is dissatisfaction. Life is unease. Life is suffering. Life is anxiety. And the causing of that is our attachment to the way we want things to be. Okay? So... It's simply not accepting how things are that causes us so much suffering. Say that that again. It's what? It's simply what? It's simply not accepting things as they are that causes our suffering because we want it to be different. 
it can be something as simple as a snowy day and you don't want it to be snowing. Or the reference I make a lot in Sangha is driving. I think driving is such a perfect kind of example of our interaction with the world and wanting reality to be different. And our delusions of reality may manifest. Traffic moves the way traffic moves, but we want it to move the way we want it to move. And when it doesn't, what do we do? We get angry, we get frustrated, we get annoyed, we start calling people names, we don't have any bodhicitta, no compassion for other people, um, and we're, we're in the midst of that suffering based on wanting reality to be different than it is. And that's just a simple little analogy, but that applies to so many other things in our lives. So, so I think by thinking of it that way, accepting <laughs> reality as it is, allows us to be able to transcend the suffering that we're experiencing. Okay? What do you think? Yes, no, maybe, I try it, it sucks. Absolutely. It's hard. Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah? It's also. Yeah. And that's from a lifetime of experience. That's right. The pain can just disappear if you don't choose to cling on to it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's amazing too, through mindfulness practice and, and contemplation, how we can <laughs> watch ourselves choose to suffer for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, a lot of it is because of the story of who we are. Nothing about who we actually are, but the story of who we are, or a story of what we deserve, or something we're so used to and accustomed to that I couldn't know or how I couldn't know how to function unless I was suffering because I've been doing it for so long. I know to do that. Um, so we can take that simple line from the book: acceptance is transcendence, and apply it constantly throughout the day. Um, Koyo Kabose Sensei. Uh, Yome Sensei's son um, calls them like little nuggets, little nuggets of wisdom that we can pull out in our day and apply to our day on, on uh, something that's really can be transformative and something as simple as that, looking at am I accepting the situation? How am I accepting the situation? Um, or whatever. Right um, so, back to the limitation. So why is that limitation chapter so important? What are you going through right now that makes it so significant? Well, I mean, I mean everything teaches you, so I find now that my current health issues are forcing me to live life, I guess the best way to describe it, in slow motion. And I realize how much I use my always doing something as I, I was thinking I was living presently. Being busy with whatever I was doing, but it's really not not true. Yeah, it's good. And and that's something we all experience as we start to get older. Um, Our bodies don't work the same way they used to. Um, But we still, inside ourselves, see ourselves 20 and capable of doing everything we did at 20. And you go to try to do it, and your body doesn't respond. And you're like, oh, what just happened? This is so strange. Um, And some people have a very difficult time facing those limitations. But there are advantages to having those limitations, and slowing down is one. You have to slow down. You don't have a choice. Yeah, and and what kind of awareness happens, and what kind of lessons can be learned having to slow down. What else in the book? Lots of stuff. <laughs> Pull a couple out. Let's talk about it. I read this today, and I, I love this. This is just a two-pager. It's, uh, is your switch on? Yes. I just love that. It's like, oh, yeah, okay. If you don't, if you don't turn it on, even though it's there, you're not going to let it flow through. Yeah. So that, I just... Uh, Great. What page is that? that 
It is page something. <laughs> page 21. Perfect. Um, it says in the first paragraph on page 21, when the switch is on, current flows. It lights up room or turns a motor, no matter how good the motor may be or how large the lamp may be. Unless the switch is on, the devices are useless. They're lifeless. Air is filled with sound waves of good lectures, music, and pictures, but unless you have a receiving set, you do not receive them. Okay. Uh, down towards the bottom. When one works, he has a purpose or meaning in what he is doing, so he puts his life into it. Therefore, every work is an accomplishment, a fulfillment, and it's a joy. What do you think about that? You're smiling. Because it's helped me with the dishes. I hate the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of like, dang it, I have so many dishes, I started thinking like, wow, oh, I'm really, you know, I have running water, I have food, I have these dishes that I can like, provide for my family. And so I felt accomplished at the end of doing dishes, not, dang it, like, why do I have to do the dishes? Can yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. that's good. Yeah. See, this is the big thing that I'm dealing with right now where you know, it says on the contrary if one works without a purpose or willingness the work is not work it's lifeless and that's just moving about and that's where I've had an issue of where basically it's like what is my purpose and what's going on now because I lost my job mm -hmm. um, basically lost my social life for the most part I lost everything that that I felt was purposeful for it. Good portion of what was in my life, and so finding purpose again has been an interesting journey. Yeah, our um, our our identity is so set up by what we do more than who we are, and that's a hard kind of transition when you lose a lot of that identity through what you do. Uh, I, I, I like that, though, because every work is an accomplishment, every work. And we have a tendency to give some work more value than other work. Dishes don't have value, it's, it's a chore, it's something you have to do. Um, but I know for myself, when I think, oh man, I gotta do the dishes, I go, an opportunity to practice. It should, that simple thing, washing the dishes and the opportunity to practice changes kind of the whole dynamic of having to do the dishes, okay? Um, that's what I love about Zen monasteries. When you go to Zen monasteries, you work and you <coughs> sit. That's what you do. And working and sitting are considered equal forms of practice. Sitting meditation in a Zen monastery is not a higher form of practice than washing the dishes or cleaning the latrines or scrubbing the floor. They're the same thing, but different. So what does that mean? What does that mean when we may not be doing something we like or don't like? Like there's times at my job, I hate being there, um, but I have a job. And that's got very little to do with my job. And I realize that's got more to do with me and how I feel or, or the story I'm telling about work. So I like that, it, it, that idea that Therefore, every work is accomplishment is a fulfillment if you put your life into it. And I know that's half the reason why I don't like my job is because I have that resistance of giving 100%. Yeah. We do an Excel spreadsheet. Who wants to give 100% doing an Excel spreadsheet? <laughs> but there's freedom in it, though, in doing anything 100%. Taking a shit at 100%. <laughs> there's freedom in that. Especially if you haven't gone in a while. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like in the chapter of non-attachment, he has a quote there that says, whatever we do, um, we should do sincerely, honestly, and with full strength. And when it is done, it is done. Do not become attached to it. Many people become attached to the past, to the future, and neglect um, the important present. And what you're saying is, in my opinion, if I do something well with the best, most honest, straightforward, uh, thing, you know, whether it's a bad decision, a, a bad relationship, um, uh, something I said that was intended well that came out wrong, uh, or a good work, or a hard work, or something, then when I'm done with it, I can be 
done with it because I don't have a regret about mm-hmm. it or I don't ruminate over it or don't fixate on it. I let it go because I knew I did my best. And yeah, and, and I like how he says that. he talks about that. He goes, give your give a hundred percent. Yeah, give all. And then when you're done, you're done. Yeah. That's that that non attachment is. I I did it. Now I'm going home. That's there. This, wow, I did this. I'm wonderful. I yeah. This. Or I, I didn't do it enough and I yeah, suck. Or I'm, yeah. I mean, how much do we carry with us every day that is just a story about an evaluation of who we are that day? I mean, that's, we're constantly doing that. I mean, that's one of the ideas of, of meditation is to slow down that process. And, and to become more conscious of that process. Because when you sit, it's incredibly boring. And your brain starts doing all kinds of weird things. and go down these paths and the story's coming up and you go, wow, that's how my brain works? No wonder I'm so tired. Okay? But it's a really good point that like, give me no 100%. He also says, I think in the book that Buddhism means living a life without regret. And that's investing yourself totally into what you're doing, no matter what it is. Washing the dishes, putting your shoes on, taking a bath, going to the bathroom, making love, making dinner, walking to the bus stop, whatever it is, to be fully present. You know. What else? How about the chapter on selfishness on page 38? The romantic in me likes the one about (laughs) his happiness is her happiness, his suffering is her suffering. About yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love the paragraph because it just seems so like utopian. It seems so awesome. That's exactly what I want. But there's some pragmatics in there that we consider. Um, but I, I really agree with that. So I think the the thing that's that's um, beautiful about that, and I think there's there's some great lessons that happened by by being in love um, in that sense of you want the other person's complete happiness especially when you first fall in love you know uh, that wonderful madness that we call love um, but it's, it's taking that sentiment and expanding it out um, beyond just that one person or um, that feeling we have towards our children. Um, in the sutras, it talks a lot about um, they love all people like they love their only son or their only daughter. Um, and that, that, that expansive care, you know. Um, but he says, true self is selflessness. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Or is that just some nice words that you would put on a Hallmark card or a, life coach would tell you when you're being a jerk? Well, attachment to what I need, what I want, how I feel, what I'm going to accomplish, how successful I am, how I'm seen, um, how much I have to do, how much fun I'm going to have. Attachment to all that stuff, that's selfishness, and it's all attachment, a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Plus, I think, I mean, I hear echoes when I hear that thing of lose yourself and find yourself, and other religions have echoes of that, and I've always felt that some of that is pretty true. Mm-hmm. You know, like, um, gosh, you're a parent. Um, I raised four kids. They're all through college now. But um, losing yourself in that is really finding yourself. I mean, I lost 30 years, you could say. <laughs> but I found friends. I found, you know, I'll never be alone in that sense. So. It was good. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. 
So how do you learn to not be selfish or, or kind of gauge or, or measure camera being selfish? Because I, I, honestly, <laughs> I'm a selfish person. But how do I gauge, how do you figure out whether it's hurting other people or if it's healthy for you or what do you do with that? Yeah, Excuse me. that's the practice. Oh, yeah. Um, we're all selfish. Yeah. yeah. All of us, I'm selfish. Sharon, I'm, she's really I'm selfish. I'm the center of my world. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, and I think that's what the, the, the practice is to, to diminish that inherent selfishness. But that inherent selfishness comes from a perspective or a story of what life is and meaning is. Um, the ego self needs to defend its stories. Um, and to defend its stories, it's going to think about one thing, itself. Um, anything that challenges those stories is going to be considered um, an enemy or detrimental or uh, fearful, um, the enemy, the other, whatever other definition you want to give it. Um, and the practice helps us to see that that's not the real self that the real self is found in our selflessness. Um, I like what he said, my life is bigger, there's more in my life as I become less selfish or self-oriented. Um, when you're self-oriented, how many people are in your world? One. <laughs> okay? you're, you're like in an enforced solitary confinement and you don't even realize it. You're not paying attention to other people, noticing what's going on around you. Yeah. And, and, and that's not just other people, too. I mean, it's the whole world around us. I mean, it's the, it's the planet Earth, it's, it's the sun, the moon, the trees, the, all that things that are constantly interacting with us, that we're living in, um, I like one teacher says, co-respondence. We're constantly responding back and forth to all these elements within our life. And I think when we have this self perspective, we are unaware of that. And it makes us very hard to, to see the grace and the abundance we have in life because we're constantly trying to prop up this, this little story self, this ego self. Um, and guess what? All that grace that's in the world could care less about your little story self. That's your own creation. You know? Um, and it's not a bad thing that you created it. It's part of being human that you created it. It's becoming aware of it and finding how to um, diminish that ego 